Welcome everybody to uh, our webinar today. We're glad that you could all um, join us. My name is Brian Ritchie. I'm the John and Kathy Martin uh, Vice President for Innovation and Associate Provost here at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, about the Idea Center, we're now um, moving on our fourth year, amazingly enough. Uh, we're the uh, organization on campus that focuses on all the commercialization and uh, licensing of technologies from the university, but we're also deeply engaged with the community and also with alums, uh, with students, as well as faculty in commercializing new technologies. Um, we, we run an accelerator uh, that includes buildings, uh, also a fund, uh, as well as integrated with students and, and student education. And uh, we're grateful today for this opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, normally, we do this uh, in person over lunch for those of you that have been with us before at Innovation Rallies. And you also know that uh, we're the reason that the ND football team wins its home games. Every time we've had one of these rallies, the team has won. Uh, and so we're hoping that that will continue even if it's virtual. Uh, so we're hoping the power of that continues on. Uh, we're cognizant that, that many of you today are not in South Bend and you'd normally be attending tomorrow's Notre Dame home football game, uh, but due to COVID and social distancing rules won't be able to. But because of this, we wanted to share a little bit of the campus with you. So we've got the Notre Dame's Glee Club and they've offered to perform a few game day songs for us. So we'll start with two uh, right now and then we'll end the webinar with one more. So we'll turn it over to the Glee Club. Rally songs of Notre Dame, sing her glory and sound her fame. Raise her gold and blue and cheer with voices true. Rah, rah, for Notre Dame, rock, rock, we will fight in every game. Strong of heart and true to her name, we will never forget her and will cheer her ever loyal to Notre Dame. Cheer, cheer for Thank you. 
I don't know about you, but that just made me want to go to a football game. So hopefully, uh, hopefully things will get back to normal as quickly as possible. Um, before we turn the time over to our speaker, we wanted to give uh, Patty Reinhardt just a few minutes to talk about our upcoming McCloskey New Venture Competition. As many of you know, Patty leads that effort for us here at the Idea Center. So Patty, I'm going to turn a little time over to you so that you can talk about what's coming up this year. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have this stage to share about the McCloskey Competition. Um, if you don't know, the McCloskey Competition is for early stage ventures who have generated no more than $5,000 in revenue, no more than $500,000 in external financing, and have been in operation for less than three years. The competition is open to all Notre Dame grad and undergrad students, staff and faculty, all Notre Dame alumni, and then all local university students and the local community members in the three county region of St. Joseph, Elkhart, and Marshall counties. Notre Dame alumni and local community teams must integrate current Notre Dame students to your team and we will assist you in this process if needed. Registration is now open. Deadline for round one submission is October 18th. Round one is going to be a simple two-page overview of your venture along with a one to two video um, submission. Those moving on to round two will submit a transitional business plan, which will be due on January 31st. We will then narrow down that to 30 semifinalists who um, pitch in April to narrow that down to determine our top five finalists who will pitch live, hopefully, in this world um, during Idea Week. Um, and that will be the third week of April. Over $400,000 of cash and in-kind prizes are available, including a $50,000 grand prize for the best Notre Dame affiliated venture, a $50,000 prize for the best community venture, and a $25,000 prize for having the best, the venture that has the best social impact. Additional benefits for participating in McCloskey, besides the amazing prizes, would be the valuable feedback that you receive from our panel over 400 plus judges during rounds one and two, connecting with a mentor after round two, and then using our robust student connections platform to help curate the right team to help move your idea forward. Um, for more information, um, mccloskey.idealcenter.ndu has all of the rules and regulations. And if you want to contact me, my information is on the Ideal Center homepage under staff. Thank you so much, Brian, for the opportunity. You bet, Patty. We're really excited about this upcoming McCloskey competition. And as you've rightly pointed out, it's a, it's a major event on campus and a great way um, for the very best companies that rise to the top to get engaged in a lot of things, including ongoing help and mentoring and funding. So thank you for your hard work on that, Patty. We'll look forward to having another great year there. Um, let me set a couple of ground rules uh, as we get started. Because this is a webinar, neither we as speakers nor the other attendees can hear or see you. Many of you have learned that already. <laughs> if you have a question for us, please use the Q&A feature within the Zoom app and we'll spend time in the last half of this webinar answering those questions. Now it's my great privilege to introduce our speaker today, who we're very fortunate to have with us. Um, a proven brand builder and entrepreneur, John Tabas is founder and chairman of The Books Company. In 2012, along with co-founder Juan Pablo Matufar, Tabas launched the Los Angeles-based company, now a leader in the online floral space that delivers flowers and plants fresh from sustainable farms around the world to doorsteps nationwide. The Books Company has received top recognition, including multiple features on Entrepreneurs 360 list and being named as one of Inc.'s top 15 companies to watch in 2017. Individually, Tabas has been recognized as a Tech Week 100 ambassador and as a finalist for the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. Prior to Books, Tabas worked in corporate brand strategy at the Walt Disney Company and in management consulting at Bain and Company. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Notre Dame and earned his MBA with honors from the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Tabas regularly speaks on brand strategy and startups and has appeared on numerous TV shows, including ABC Shark Tank, and 2020, and he acts as a mentor to early stage startups at Blue Chip Accelerator Techstars. He serves as a board member for the National Association of Women Business Owners in LA and is an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship at UCLA Anderson. 
And while they're very fortunate to have him, we'll forgive you for doing that, John, instead of <laughs> here at Notre Dame. But with that, we'll turn the time over to you, John, and thank you once again for being with us and look forward to your comments. Thanks so much, uh, Brian, and to, and to the whole team for, for having me out. It's, uh, it's bittersweet. I was actually supposed to be on campus next weekend, so this is the next best thing to be able to engage with the, with the community so close to, to football season. You guys can see I got my helmet up here. Uh, my my eight year old will be running around with that on his head later. Um, so super super pumped for the season and and to have everyone back at school and just a a real uh, shout out of appreciation to the entire community for for really leading the way on bringing bringing students back to campus and pushing on on how we can educate everyone in person safely. I think it's a it's a tribute to the dedication of of the school and to the innovative nature of the school to really go out there and 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 find a way find a way to make it work and and in a world where it's hard to do that just uh, uh big kudos to everyone who's putting in so much effort student staff um faculty and 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 the professors so um as as brian so kindly introduced i'm, I'm john uh class of, of 2000 uh, very proud alum if i had a chance to teach my course at, at notre dame i would happily do it brian so if there's we'll have a, to figure that out, John. What if there's an out? adjunct <laughs> slot open at Notre Dame, I am in 100%, and it's actually easy now to do so from Los Angeles, easier than ever. Um, we have places we can put you, John. This will be great. Yeah, we can figure it out. Um, so I'm going to take you all through a little bit of our journey um, at the Books Company. We're now a 90-person company. We've raised just under $80 million of venture financing. And so we've had a pretty fun journey sort of from the beginning. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting rejected here, uh, guys. It says host has disabled attendee screen sharing. I can guarantee you we did not do that on purpose. Uh, Nick, can you get that, uh, permission for him? Uh, now it's allowing me. Here we there go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go into slideshow. All right. Can everybody see that? Is that working for you, Brian? Right. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. So, um, you know, sort of going back and a little bit of sort of where where I came from, and, and I promise all this history will will matter in the story at some point. But I grew up in a, a tiny village outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, called Rural Ridge. This is a real picture of the real post office in Royal Ridge, Pennsylvania. The R is actually upside down. Um, this is a village, it's, it's not technically a town. Uh, it's a village because it's so small. Uh, when I grew up, it was about 300 people. I think now it's all the way up to 400 or 500 people. Um, when it was 300 people growing up, I was related to 10% of that population. And I'm not exaggerating, uh, 30 people of the 300 were my family. And my, my grandfather, George, uh, was the mayor of our little town because he had been the foreman of the coal mine that was the reason the town existed. Um, eventually that coal mine shut down before I was born, um, but it was a very remote area. I got bused about an hour um, to high school um, as a teenager and about 20, 25 minute drive to any kind of civilization. And the reason this is relevant is that there wasn't much to do. Um, I had, you know, the, the friends and family around, but there, there was really no entertainment. So as a kid, I spent a lot of my time sort of doing two things. And the first was storytelling. I drew comic books. I wrote uh, fiction uh, and I made movies. Here I am starring as, um, as a private eye detective or something in one of these movies I made. And, um, and that was the beginning of, of really loving telling a great story uh, loving the idea of engaging people and entertaining people in some way. And I had no idea it would ever be relevant uh, to my career, but I continued this all the way through high school with musicals and choir and, um, and, and continued creative storytelling in, in, in lots of ways. The second thing I spent a lot of time doing was playing soccer. So I actually saw in the Glee Club uh, video, there was a, a young man uh, wearing a, a Upper St. Clair jer just soccer jersey uh, Upper St. Clair was actually one of our rivals. I played for Fox Chapel, the Fox Chapel Foxes. Um, we beat uh, Upper St. Clair my senior year to win the, the Western Pennsylvania title, which was awesome. Um, the point here is that I had these two passions and I, and I pursued them fervently throughout my youth and, and through high school. And when I got to Notre Dame, um, I was actually a preferred walk-on for the Notre Dame soccer team. 
and, uh, but not for long. Um, at Notre Dame, uh, I lasted all about two weeks on the soccer team before I was cut. And this was an absolutely devastating moment in my life. I had spent so much time and, and, and so much preparation sort of getting ready for my college soccer career and to just fall a little bit short was really a, a sort of soul searching moment for me. And it actually made me question Notre Dame as my home for, for a little bit. Um, it was sort of hard to imagine my life without, you know, soccer really being a key part of it. Uh, but sort of starting here and going clockwise, I started off with soccer and, uh, and not too long after I found my path at Notre Dame. Um, I actually joined the Glee Club uh, midway through freshman year. And, um, and then, uh, and then uh, as a sophomore, I actually walked onto the football team. And a little known fact, I don't know it for sure, but I think I'm the only person ever have been on the football team's roster and in the Glee Club at the same moment. And the way that happened was I walked on, was asked to come back for the winter workouts, did the winter workouts, did my spring tryout, was put on the roster, and then Urban Meyer cut me later. Um, and so I saw my name on the roster, it was a real thing. Um, but did not end up playing at any point. There was, I was asked to come back in the fall and try out again, but other things had started to become you know, more interesting for me. I ended up uh, as, a, as a Bengal bout boxer. I did that for, for a year. I was in the applied investment management class with John Affleck Graves and Scott Malpass, two Notre Dame legends today. I raised about $25,000 to, to, to form this statue here that now sits on the uh, west side of campus, um, Christ the Teacher. Um, I built post Notre Dame, uh, a website called HerLoyalSons.com, which at one point was generating 50,000 uniques a month, all talking about Notre Dame football back in the Brady Quinn years. Still exists today. Uh, go check it out. It's, I'm not as involved now. Um, and then I came back to campus as a writer for Her Loyal Sons and went through the fantasy football camp with Brian Kelly and, and all the coaches taking us through it. I then produced uh, an Irish tailgating song CD where I partnered up with a, an authentic Irish musician and, and pulled in Notre Dame lore. And we co-wrote a CD that was sold in the Notre Dame bookstore for a period of time. You can still find it um, in lots of stores online. It's called Forever Irish. And today I, I uh, very informally consult with the athletic department uh, with, with Jack and, and the team there and, and Rob, and then also help out as much as I possibly can with the Idea Center. All of this is essentially to say, I loved my Notre Dame experience. I would do anything for the University of Notre Dame. And, um, and it really set the stage for who I would become later in life because of all these opportunities to experience such an, an, a rich culture and ways to try to learn about myself as a human being. Um, and most importantly, it brought me and JP together. This is us, I think this is sophomore or junior year. There was, we were at Dylan Hall guys, and this is a 1970s themed dance. I've never looked cooler in my entire life. And, uh, and JP had a legitimate afro there that he, that he picked out. And um, we became really fast friends by forming a band. And this was a, I, I, have, to, I have to at least tout at the time, the most, the most popular band at Acoustic Cafe our junior and senior year called Sexual Chocolate. And it was legitimately the worst band you'll ever see musically. We were not, we were not good at, at the singing and the performing, um, but we were hilarious. And we actually broke fire code a number of times at La Fun. And uh, it, was, it was a great time. And uh, he and I became really good friends, you know, through this process of building this band, which performed at, um, at NAS twice. We actually won the Battle of the Bands senior year uh, while performing um, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. We actually brought some of my friends from the Glee Club in and did a full version of Bohemian Rhapsody at NAS. So, this is a long-winded way of getting to JP and I became really good friends. Um, but then we sort of parted ways. I went off and worked at Bain & Company um, and, then, uh, and then came out here to, uh, to Los Angeles to go to UCLA for graduate school and landed at, at the Walt Disney Company, did a little bit of marketing for Gerber Baby in between. And while I was at Disney and, and at these previous stops, I always had sort of an itch to, to keep that variety of, of things that I tried and that I did at Notre Dame going. And... Um, you know, at Disney, I did amazing things, though. We worked on ESPN.com. Two weeks in, it was like, hey, let's go work on ESPN.com. Uh, I worked on the Disney Shanghai Resort, worked on uh, robotics and, and advanced technology, worked on ABC and ABC's Lost. Had a really amazing six-year run at the Walt Disney Company after graduate school. Um, but these side gigs always pulled me back. Producing music, 
producing independent film, being in a band. I started a dog walking business at one point. Um, just a lot of entrepreneurial ventures, business plans that never quite got, got all the way there, nonprofit plans. And so I was always tinkering. And, uh, and at one point, I, I really felt like I wanted to go do that. But I wasn't sure how to get from where I was, which was a corporate job at corporate brand management at the Walt Disney Company, uh, which is, you know, a, a great job, but a classic corporate environment. You know, nine to six, nine to seven, business casual, lots of resources, 230,000 cast members helping us really drive this business every day. And uh, I wasn't sure how to get there. So I, I, I talked to some friends. I had some friends who started companies. I was very lucky when I was at Bain and Company to meet a guy named Andy Dunn. And Andy Dunn founded a company called Bonobos. Um, we actually ended up being roommates for two years prior to, to business school for both of us, uh, me at UCLA and him at, at Stanford. And so I pinged Andy and I said, hey, what should I do here? Like, how do I learn to be an entrepreneur or if I even want to? And he was like, well, just go get a job at a startup. So I interviewed at Facebook. I interviewed at Twitter. I got a job offer at Twitter. Um, but, but the pay cut was frankly just too dramatic. They wanted me to take a 75% pay cut to start the Los Angeles office of Twitter. And it just made me too nervous. I wasn't quite that risk tolerant at that point. But then Shoe Dazzle came along and Shoe Dazzle was Kim Kardashian's subscription shoe company, which was a rocket ship in Los Angeles at the time. I joined his employee, maybe 100, and immediately fell in love with what was early stage startup. The energy, the creativity, the problem solving, all these things that I loved about all those sort of pseudo ventures at Notre Dame and, and side gigs came to life in my job at Shoe Dazzle. And I immediately was like, this is what I have to do. Um, so I knew then that I wanted to start something, but I had absolutely no idea how to do it. Um, and then I got inspired. And it was by getting reconnected with JP, Juan Pablo Montufo Arroyo. Uh, JP it, it had a, a biochemistry undergrad at Notre Dame, went to business school at Notre Dame, and then went back to Ecuador, his home country, to run a floral farm. Even when we were in the band back in the day, JP had a passion for flowers, and he made that passion into his dream job as general manager of a large rose grower in the Cayambe region outside of Quito, Ecuador. And JP reached out to me one day when I was at Shoe Dazzle, and I hadn't been there long, maybe two or three months. And he said, hey, you know, there's a lot of problems in this industry for farmers. And, and the problems were both economic and sort of uh, mission related. On the economic side, farmers sit at the beginning of the value chain. They have little power in the value chain. They get paid late. They often don't get paid at all. And they're operating on really thin margins with high fixed costs. You have a lot of land and a lot of labor uh, when it comes to flower farming. And so he described those challenges to me. The other challenge was around uh, responsibility. You know, they, they invested in his farm a lot around sustainability, protecting the planet, and also uh, protecting labor and really taking care of their people. In flower farming, 75% of the farmhands are, are women. Um, for most of them, it's, it's the only job they'll ever have. But the average tenure in a field is two or three years. At JP's farm, the average tenure was over 20 years because they treated their people so well. But the hard thing in the way that the flower industry works is that there's a long supply chain between the farmer and the consumer. So the consumer never even knew that some farms operated the way JP operated and some farms didn't. There was no label on the stems that said, here's a, a really responsibly grown stem and here's one that maybe, maybe is not. And so JP had these challenges and he, he wanted to help me to help him think through how to shorten the supply chain and really get out there and, and drive this uh, messaging around the, the way that they do things and also create better economics. At the same time, I thought about my own recent purchasing experience in floral and really how miserable it made me. You know, if you go online and you type in, you know, flower delivery, you're going to get a lot of ads on Google and it's going to say $19.99 or $24.99. And then when you get to checkout, it's going to say your real price, which is $69 or $75, whatever it might be. I was going back in 2011, 2012 to buy my mom flowers, which is a, something that should make you feel good, right? You're being a, a kind son, a, a kind person when you send flowers. And I saw this experience happen to me three or four times on three or four different websites. And then I was frustrated. And I was sitting here going, why, why am I doing something kind for someone where I should feel good and happy? And instead, I'm feeling very frustrated. I, and I thought, you know, that these brands just don't speak to me. And so I thought, if there's a problem here with the farmer, the beginning of the value chain, the most important part of the supply chain, and if there's a problem here for the, for the consumer, if I'm in any way representative 
of the way that people experience this category of online flowers, what's going on in between that's causing the problem? And so JP and I started talking and we decided to start a company and we started under these two hypotheses. The first is that the supply chain makes no sense. Uh, there are five or six players all moving the product from South America to the United States. It takes a long time for them to arrive. About half of them will die without ever being sold. So there's massive economic and environmental waste. All these different players have no data sharing and no, no technology to optimize that supply chain. And this is a globally $100 billion category. So to have such an inefficient machine, we thought was a great opportunity for us. And then the second is that there are no large consumer brands in floral. There are brands that exist like FTD and 100 Flowers. These are primarily B2B companies that make money by selling software and services to florists, not by selling flowers to consumers, even though they do so. And so our thought was we can build the Starbucks of flowers in this category. We can really redefine the customer experience, stand for something unique around our supply chain, which creates fresher, more affordable flowers, better value, longer vase life, and also for sustainability and really responsible growing. So on the first one, you know, a lot of people don't know that 90% of the flowers that we all consume in the United States are grown in, in South America and particularly Ecuador and Colombia. And that's, that's for two main reasons. One is they're on the equator, so they have very consistent temperatures. So you can actually trick a plant into thinking that it's in season by planting at altitude. At the top of a mountain, it's winter. At the bottom, it's summer. And in between are spring and fall. And so all the production of flowers in the United States moves down into Ecuador and Colombia. But then you need a way to get it to the customer and up grows this, uh, this supply chain that I'll take you through now. So the farmer grows the product, they mark it up, and they sell to importers and brokers in Miami. Those importers and brokers will mark it up, they take margin, they take time, and therefore they create waste. They then sell to wholesalers who move the product around the country, margin, time, and waste. The wholesaler sells to a local florist, margin, time, and waste. And the florist gets their orders from 100 Flowers or FTD who also take margin. And so you have these five or six players, all this waste, again, half the flowers dying. It takes two weeks to get the flowers to the florist. Um, and flowers only last about 20, 21 days. So you're only left with about a week left when it hits the, the local store. There's no transparency of sourcing. And it's really challenging for farmers as, as attested to by my co-founder. So when we launched Spooks, we said, well, we're just gonna ship from the farm. We deployed technology at the farm itself. We ship directly from there to the end customer. That means we have two players instead of five or six. Our waste rate was about two and a half percent over the life of the business instead of that 50%. So we're doing much better in terms of protecting the environment, eliminating waste. Uh, we deliver in one or six days, depending on where you are and where the flowers are coming from compared to that 17 days in the standard supply chain. We have 100% transparency so we can hold farmers accountable and we pay farmers more and we pay them faster. And so this was our hypothesis we launched with just two farms in Ecuador and Colombia. Um, we now have 140 farms around the world that we work with in South America, across the United States, Canada, um, in Africa, and pretty soon in Japan. On, in a post-COVID world, we'll be sourcing from Japan as well. And our technology is really deployed at all of these nodes and helps us source and then uh, distribute product extremely efficiently and way more uh, economically beneficial for both us and the farmers. The second hypothesis is around brand. Um, that sustainable supply chain gives us a firm base from which to operate. Um, but we also focus a lot on technology, making it easier to order, especially around subscriptions. We have a very flexible subscription program that's 30% off and free delivery. You can skip a month, you can use it for mom one month, sister another month, send it to yourself another. And it, it drives a different customer experience with a category where they wanna send more flowers more often because it's affordable and it's easy, we're great on customer service, and we're very transparent about our pricing because we control the supply chain, and that, that's also why you get what you order. Uh, when you order from one of our farms, that is routed to the farm itself that is growing the product. And all of these things create a brand loyalty, which then creates margin and better economics for the business. So sort of rewinding a minute, that's the hypothesis, but we haven't even decided to start the company. And so, we, we, we're sort of talking about this, like, are we gonna do this? Or are, we gonna, are we gonna make this work? And we had a couple, you know, extenuating circumstances. We weren't 23 year old first time founders coming out of school. We were, you know, my JP had a job and a family in Ecuador. I had a job, I had a nine month old baby at the time. And we had just bought a house out here in Venice Beach, California, which is not 
the most affordable place in the world to buy a home. And my wife was making it rain as an assistant principal in public education. And so we didn't really, you know, have a lot to go on here. We didn't have a bunch of money in the bank, um, but we did it anyway. And so here's a quick sidebar on, on risk. Starting a company is not risky. It's just not. Everyone talks about how 90% of startups fail and, it, and, and the chances are if you start a company, it will not work, but it's still not risky and here's why. The first is if you try to start a company and you fail, you will learn more in the time that you try to start a company than in, sorry, no offense to the business school, it's the best business school in the world, than you learn at Mendoza or that you learn in business school or that you learn in any job. And the reason why is you have to do everything and you have to do it super well in a very short time frame. So even if it fails, you learn a bunch and now you're worth more in the market. And then let's say that it takes you six months and you totally fail and you don't earn anything in that time frame. The total amount of earnings that you put at risk is six months of your current salary divided by your entire career of earning. And I don't know what that is going to be, but it's not going to be a massive percentage of your lifetime earning. So you're not giving up that much in terms of cash compensation. You're not going to starve unless you are. If, if you're literally to do this company, you're going to starve, then you should not start the company. You should find some other way to get it going. But a lot of us, um, especially at Notre Dame, have a community, a family, you have uh, colleagues and, and classmates and friends who will let you bum a couch, let you borrow a computer, lend you a little bit of money to help make your dream happen. And so there's ways to de-risk on top of that. You can lean on that community. Uh, when I started the Books company, I quit my job at Shoe Dazzle. I worked as a consultant about 20 hours a week for about six months just to kind of keep the lights on. So there's ways to de-risk. And then again, later on, you're employable either way. If it works and you now are, are crushing it as an entrepreneur, the world is gonna come at you with opportunities you could never dream. And if it fails completely, again, you're more employable because of the learning that you have. So for any of you thinking about starting a company, you're like, I don't know if it's the right time. I don't know if I could make it work. Oh, it's really risky. Think about these bullet points and remember, it's not really that risky. So we're, we're thinking about doing this and, and, and I, my father-in-law um, is a wildly successful um, businessman at one point was chief digital officer of, of Kroger, the largest grocer in the world. Prior to that was COO of Kroger, ran their entire supply chain. This is a highly accomplished, very smart, and very respected man and, and a good friend and, and family member for me. Um, but rightfully so, when I was talking about leaving my full paying job to go and make zero dollars to start a flower company, he sat me down and gave me the riot act. And he was like, what are you doing? What, like, you had a great job at Disney, you went to this crazy startup for six months and now you're leaving that to go off and, and do this crazy thing. Like, what are you thinking? And that conversation was in, 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 in my car on our side street. This isn't my street. My street isn't this cool looking. This is probably Chicago. Um, but uh, but he, I said to him, you know, dad, this is my time to bet on me. I, I've had a great corporate career at Bain and Disney where I bet on the company and I can help. You know, I, I help the Walt Disney Company more than zero but a cruise ship, if you move it one degree, is a massive win. I wanted to see what would happen if I was making the calls. If this whole thing, I put it right on my shoulders and I try to trudge this up the hill myself. Um, and he still thought I was nuts uh, until four or five later, years later, we were doing tens of million dollars of revenue. And then he thought it was, it was a fine idea. Um, but in that moment, it was sort of, we were diving in and doing this thing. So we went out and we raised a friends and family round. These are example friends and family rounds. Um, you know, you could guess where the Books company landed. Um, we landed right here, $13,000 of friends and family money. And eight of that came from my co-founder and I. So he put in four, I put in four. I got my mom, my sister, and a couple of buddies from Bain & Company to kick in a couple thousand each. And we were at $13,000 and we were going to go build this company from scratch. Um, and this was the team when we launched. So myself and, and my puppy, Billy Jean, were on the couch in, in L.A., I hired an intern from UCLA to do our development. My good buddy, Dave, was working part-time nights and weekends from an advertising agency. I brought my mom at 70 years old out of retirement to do customer service from Pittsburgh, and JP was down on the farm in Ecuador. We had no budgets for anything, no marketing budgets. We had no headquarters. We had WhatsApp, we had email, and we had what was the jankiest website you've probably ever seen when we first launched the business. And the way that we launched it was around story and hustle. 
And this is something that is absolutely crucial for any startup, whether you're a SaaS business, software, hard tech, IOT, consumer, e-commerce, whatever it might be, you need to build a great story and you need to hustle the heck out of that story. Whether you have $13,000 in the bank or 13 million, this is the key to getting the world to believe in what you're doing. That's not just consumers, that's potential employees, that's potential investors, that's potential partners. Um, you need to build a great story and you need to hustle that story. And so for Books, you know, we started out, we had all these great attributes about the business, sustainable flowers, uh, very fresh, reducing waste, beautiful product, um, all these really interesting things. And when I went around and talked to people about this brand and what we were gonna do, I got a lot of this, mm, that's really nice. And that was not a compelling response. When you're trying to build a company from scratch, you can't go out with a story that people go, ah, that's really nice. Um, so we kept working on the story and working on the story. And in one meeting one day, uh, we, we on a sidebar talked about how JP lives down in Cayambe, which is an active volcano in Ecuador. And he said, whoa, 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 you have a volcano? He's like, that's more interesting than everything else you have. And we were like, wow, that's right. We've been to this place a million times. It's a really big mountain, it's beautiful, but this is a really interesting piece of our story. And our story shifted from being about the benefits to being about we drop ship flowers from an active volcano for $40 flat. And all of a sudden, boom, people cared. When we shared that story, people said, I care about this story. I want to learn more. And then we hustled the heck out of that story. I emailed 2,700 individual people the first week after launch telling them about this uh, product. I emailed ex-girlfriends that I hadn't talked to in seven or eight years. I emailed friends and family. I emailed anyone that I knew and said, you should try this out because it's better in the world. And also because I hope you care about me a little bit and you'll give us a little bit of a boost. We did $8,000 of revenue in our first month. We did 12,000 the second, then 20. We were at $100,000 a month, a $1.2 million run rate within four months. All because of great story and great hustle. This is just a, a few shots of the company at that beginning. This is our very first shipment here with JP. I think it's 11 orders. He had to bring his mother and his sister up to the farm to create the boxes manually because our box shipment had not arrived on time for the first shipment. Uh, these are the things you do when you're early on in the company. We grew, obviously a lot more shipments here. Um, here's our, our company when we were in a, a little bungalow in Venice we rented, we got to about 12 people in that bungalow. You can see the team there on the steps. Um, around that time, I was asked to appear on, on ABC's Shark Tank. Uh, I'm sure there will be Q&A about that, so I'll save a little bit of the detail for that later. And then, you know, we, we moved on to another headquarters. We left this last headquarters about 40 people. We're now in about 14,000 square feet here in Marina del Rey with about 93 people in the company, and we're growing quickly. We'll be about 105 in, uh, in two months. So it's been a really great journey. I won't touch on all these um, super fun milestones that we had. Um, but there are some that were really fun. We did Robert Herjavec's wedding flowers. Uh, Robert Herjavec then ended up actually investing in the company in our Series C. Um, we moved in our new headquarters about two years ago. Um, again, we've raised about $80, $80 million in, in total venture capital. And we're now a truly global, truly national company. Some fun facts along the way. Our volcano erupted twice. Um, thankfully, no one was hurt. Um, all the, the volcanic ash fell on the flowers, which made for some really great social media moments. Uh, we worked 330 florists nationwide as well for same day delivery. Our, our farm network, which is 140 farms, grows about 1.7 billion stems of flowers per year. And we've shipped over 3.5 billion and they've traveled uh, a long distance across South America, the US and across the United States. Um, and that's the story uh, of Books to date. You know, the ending is TBD. I recently stepped out of the CEO role into the chairman of the board role. Um, uh, I, can, I can talk more about that in the Q&A as well, but the company continues to evolve. We have a growing wedding business. Uh, we're moving into, into brick and mortar retail uh, next year. We plan to do it this year, but COVID throws everyone for a loop and so changed our timing a bit. Um, so my, my closing advice is it's not that risky. So live in a tree, live in a tree is a thing my dad always said to me growing up. He said, you like to live in a tree because I just like to try things that seemed weird and, and out of nowhere, but it's the best way to live life. You never know what's gonna happen if you don't. And it's always very interesting. Uh, be super thankful for what you have. We're in a, we're in a, a tough place as a, as, a, as a country, as a community and as a world right now. Um, but, but we have so many blessings in our lives, whether it's to be a, a great part of this amazing university and the community beyond it, whether it's our personal health, um, our, our, the roof over our head, the food on our table, 
stay thankful for the things that you have. And then when you think about where you want to land eventually, don't try to skip. There are no shortcuts. Um, be better today than yesterday. Think about it as incremental change. I had this dream of being a founder and then a chairman at some point. It's been now a seven and a half year journey, but by getting a little bit better every single day, every single month, every single year, we've gotten to where we wanted to go. Um, with that, um, you know, I'd just say the best way to start a company is to just start a company. And this is a random picture of me with Jeff Goldblum because I thought it was funny. That's awesome. Thanks, what everybody. a great story, John. Thank you for, for sharing that with, with us. We've got a, a bunch of questions. I'm going to start with the one that you mentioned that is pretty obvious, which is why, why did you even go to Shark Tank? What was, uh, and, and, and let, me, let me couch that in the big funding question, right? Because so many of our entrepreneurs are so concerned about the money part. You know, how do I get the money? How do I get the resources? And, and frankly, I, given my experience in venture, Flowers is not where most venture capitalists are excited to go, right? It's not a SaaS-based company. I, how do you think about recurring revenue? So, you know, you've raised multiple rounds of funding. How did you do it? Maybe weave those stories together a little bit from your funding and from uh, the, the, the Shark Tank story. Sure thing, absolutely, yeah. Fundraising is this really tricky piece of building a company. And I think everyone thinks they have to raise money. I think the first question you should ask yourself as an entrepreneur is do you have to raise money? And frankly, if you don't have to, don't. Um, there's two sort of paths that you can take and they're kind of one or the other. There's no really a middle ground here, which is if you're gonna raise money, you have to be aiming to be a company worth a half billion dollars. If you're gonna raise VC money, you gotta be aiming really big. If you're not sure, raise from angel investors, don't raise it all, bootstrap it, maintain control. Ending up in the middle is really no man's land and it's a place that's really hard to operate. So I think the first question is, do you need money? Um, I decided very early on that I wanted this thing to be huge. I was building the Starbucks of flowers. So I went out and started pitching this business within the first month post launch. And, uh, and I was terrible at it. I failed up and down left and right. I was unprofessional. I, my deck was terrible. I didn't know how to pitch. I didn't know who to pitch. I was pitching the wrong people in the wrong firms. And after about six weeks, I shut it down. because I knew it wasn't going to work out. So we focused on the business and we, we, we scaled that up to that $100,000 a month in revenue. And then, then I had sort of done some research, learned how to pitch, and then went out and all of a sudden the response was very different. We're now doing 100,000 a month in sales. My pitch is pretty clean. Um, and so my approach was not a sophisticated approach in the beginning, but we learned as we went. And we ran, ended up raising a $1.7 million seed round in the spring of 2013. Um, and that was really, that was not like one big investor came in and said, I'll give you $1.5 million. It was incremental wins. It was proof points along the way. Uh, we started off, I got my buddy Andy Dunn to be on the board of advisors. That's a proof point. Oh, if Andy Dunn's going to invest, then maybe somebody else should invest. And then we got Amplify, which is an accelerator out here. A proof point saying, these guys are legit. And then we got Wavemaker, which is one of the best VCs out here in Los Angeles to write a pretty large first check. It was you know, not, not the majority of the round, but a real check from a real institution. And then all the angels and all the other micro VCs that were sort of dancing around the edges with us said, oh yeah, I want you to have my money too. The hard money to raise is the first money. All the rest of it becomes really darn easy once you have proof points. And so again, instead of trying to start at the end saying, I need a one $1.7 million investor, we built our reputation through the network and ended up closing that, that $1.7 million round. I Around the same time, was when Shark Tank kind of came across the radar. And I had been a fan, you know, a viewer of the show for years as a business person and as a guy who worked at Disney when it launched, I was very familiar and I watched every Friday. Um, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go on the show. And the reason was that I knew that my, my valuation was fixed. I had already raised my money. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be one of those entrepreneurs that goes in there where they accuse of, oh, you're just here for the, the publicity. You're not even going to negotiate. But I didn't really have a choice. My price was fixed. We raised $1.7 million at roughly an $8 million valuation. That's where we were. And so I, I hemmed and hawed and sort of thought about it a lot, ended up thinking, you know, when else am I going to get 7 million people to learn about the brand? And even if they edit it and or I come off looking not the best, it's going to be really great for the company. And hopefully we can get one of the sharks in as well. Um, so I ended up going to the last day of filming, uh, when, one thing people don't know about Shark Tank is you don't film for seven minutes, which is what ends up on the air. I filmed for an hour and 50 some minutes and it's under the lights and they are grilling you. I mean, the sharks come after you. Um, I got roundly destroyed by all the sharks. Barbara hated the name. 
Uh, Robert thought that because we were, we were moving from South America only to California for faster delivery, um, that that was breaking the business model. Um, and Mr. Wonderful said he was going to send flowers to my grave. He, he literally <laughs> said it at the end of the episode. Um, so got completely rejected. But, um, but three years later, Robert came back and said, hey, John, I'm getting married to Kim Johnson from Dancing with the Stars. He had just come off the show. And I remembered your, your display and how beautiful it was help me learn about this and maybe you can help me out with my wedding. We did his wedding flowers. We saved him a ton of money. And on the back end, after having spent that time with me, he said, well, now I want to invest. So Robert ended up becoming an investor in our series C. What a great story. I love the incremental part of that story too, where one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. Well, we're big on that at the idea center to just get the next milestone proof points, right? Milestone points, build the next thing. I love that. I love that part. You must be thinking then, as you went after this venture money, we can build a half a billion dollar business at least. You must be thinking there's an exit at some point. What, what do you think that looks like? Yeah, you know, um, there's a lot, I get a lot of questions along the way about like, what's your exit strategy? And I find this question confounding hmm. because I don't get to buy my own company. Someone else is gonna buy my company and they're gonna decide whether our company is worthwhile to buy or not. Um, and or we're going to be independently uh, capable of operating profitably at scale and we're going to go public. Right. Um, both of those require us to just go build the best possible company we can build. Now, do I have an idea of who might think about buying us? Sure. Big retail is probably the most likely place we might land, you know, a strategic buyer. Um, uh, there's international M&A that's possible um, and or we could take it public or to, or to big private equity. Right. So all of these are potential paths. But at the end of the day, what we need to build is an amazing brand, a great customer experience that creates profit. And if we do those things, the exit will come. Um, mm -hmm. And so our sites continue to be set on a very big, big outcome independently. But if the right partner comes along where it's going to add more value for our current shareholders, both in an exit price and potential upside, um, we'll certainly you know, have the conversation. But, uh, but having an exit plan to me is strange because if I had an exit plan, I would just say, it's for someone awesome to buy us for a half billion dollars in two years from now. And that would be my exit plan. And that would be right. awesome. That would be yeah. perfect. Yeah. Um, but we don't get to control it. So we're really focused on just building the best company we can build. That's a great answer as well. We have a number of people asking about your transition from uh, the, the CEO of the company to the chairman. What, what were you thinking there? Who did you get to bring in to run the company? And, and what's next for you then? So yeah, it's, it's actually something I've thought about for a while. You know, one of the hardest things about being a founder and a CEO is that the whole thing is on you. And that seems great. And it is great in a lot of ways. It's also very painful in a lot of ways. Um, so about, you know, call it three, four years in, my personal enjoyment of the job of CEO was declining. Mm. And the reason why is that I'm a strategy guy, right? Bain, Disney, corporate strategy. I think big long-term. I don't think day-to-day -day execution. It's just not just the way my brain works. And I'm, as I talked about earlier, a storyteller and a creative, not necessarily a disciplined operator. And when you look at what the company needs from kind of year four up, where you're getting the sizable revenue, sizable team, is you need someone who loves to and is great at operating. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't having the best time doing that job. And, and I knew that there were better people out there doing it. At the same time, the company wasn't ready for me to step out of that role. It was too much still wrapped in me as the founder. Um, I needed to build a team, build process, get to a place where both in the, in the metrics and the culture and the team and the leadership that I could make that transition. So I took another two years roughly to get that work done. And thankfully we got some amazing people to join us. Our COO, Darcy, our CFO, Tony, um, my co-founder, JP, an amazing group of folks leading the team where I felt like about a year ago, hey, I, I could make this transition and have it be really good for the company. So that was sort of the, the core piece was, what am I best at and is that what the company needs? Um, the sort of related piece to it was, I missed the building of new stuff. Like we were building new things all the time, but the speed with which you build when you're going through a 90 person organization versus a five is dramatically different mm -hmm. versus you know 200,000 at Disney. And so I wanted to be in a place where I could build those new things quickly and easily um, without it sort of being part of the larger org, if you will. So I'm sort of as chairman, I've, I have two main roles. One is coach, partner, 
um, support for our CEO. Um, our new CEO is Alejandro Bethlin. He came from Amazon. Uh, he was general manager of Amazon Flex in Europe, previous to that chief of staff for Amazon Europe's CEO, and previous to that up, in, up north in uh, Amazon HQ. And so an amazingly accomplished human being, super smart, Procter & Gamble and Amazon trained. We could not have hired anyone better to run the company. And I'm learning from him every day how to be a great leader, how to be a great CEO. He's the perfect guy to take it to that next level. Um, but I'm not disengaged. I'm still very much engaged with him on that role. And then helping the company build out into new territories. Japan um, is, is sort of the primary one that we're focused on. And then new pieces of the business, retail, uh, new, re new user experiences, those types of things. And so it's been a really great transition. We did it in the midst of COVID, all 100% um, via Zoom. And so uh, the team has really done a great job of making that transition work. Fantastic. Let me weave another couple of questions together that I think might be interesting. Uh, there's a question here that basically asks, from the original idea to what Books is today, was it true to that? Did it change? Did it pivot? Were there key places where you're like, man, we can't really do what we thought we were going to do, and it turned into something a little bit different than you and JP initially thought? And then along with that, there, there must have been problems that you ran into, things like customs clearances or ag costs or just, just issues, hurdles you had to get over, uh, maybe that caused the pivot, maybe that just caused innovation. So I'd love to hear, I know that's a big question, but maybe you could tell a little bit of the story about, you know, did you get where you wanted to go? Where were the pivots and where were the big obstacles and how did you overcome them? Absolutely. Yeah. So we were one of the lucky startups in the sense that we didn't have, you know, a, a 90 degree or 180 degree pivot. We didn't change the business completely from our initial mission, which was control the supply chain, ensure sustainability, quality, freshness, build a great brand. That's all still there, but the way we do it has changed significantly. At the very beginning, our hypothesis was two main things. One is everyone's gonna order via subscription and it's gonna be guys, we're building a brand for guys. Mm -hmm. um, within two months, we were placing you know, content on Facebook and no guys were clicking on it and lots of women were clicking on it. Why? Guys are less likely to click on pictures of flowers on Facebook. It's just the way it turned out to be. And so all of a sudden we were like, well, we're a brand for women now. Let's go do that. Um, and then what we found very quickly was we had one price, $40 flat, free shipping, no sizes, no vases, the simplest possible way you could order. And our thesis was everyone else is so complex, we need to be super simple. Um, but customers very quickly came to us and said, hey, I want it faster. And so that's when we launched our domestic farms, but we had to charge more for that. So gone was the one price. And then people said, wait, this is too small for me. I want to send more. I'll happily pay more, but I want to send more. Then came our deluxe size, which was double the, the number of stems. Now you have two modalities of delivery and two sizes. And then people said, I want to send even more. So then our grand size was launched. Then people said, we want vases. All of a sudden our value prop and our supply chain got infinitely more complex than we thought it was going to be at the beginning. We really thought this was going to be simple rules. And really what it ended up being was people cared a lot about that origin story and how we grew the flowers. And they cared a lot about the design being unique and different. They didn't care so much about this soup. Now, some people rebelled. Some of our customers were like, you got rid of the $40 flat. I'm, over. I'm done with you. But a heck of a lot more customers came in and spent a lot more because we had these options. So we listened to the customers really the whole time. And the, the business model got more complex. And the way we solved that was we just built technology. It, if we just had people doing all these things across all these permutations, we'd have to hire 300, 400 people and we'd go bankrupt in a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so our, our, our thesis shifted from, at the beginning we thought technology was sort of a small piece of what we do. As the complexity grew, technology became a bigger and bigger piece. And now tech and product together is the largest team in the organization and probably the space where we've spent the most, by far the most money other than marketing, um, you know, in, in the history of the company. In terms you know, of the, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, ironically, that may be, you know, the tech enabled service part of what you do may have been also what drove the VC interest. Uh, 100%. Companies, right? Yeah, because of different way of doing the business. Exactly. And that's, you know, you know, how do you get the VCs in, in interested in this space? It became about this platform we were building, which is much bigger than selling flowers. It's about optimizing a supply chain. It's about the big vision that this technology could enable. And so, uh, and then, you know, in terms of the ups and downs, um, 
it's all ups and downs. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are someone who can't handle emotional swings, this is not for you. And I, I can say very forthrightly and very honestly, at times this journey is incredibly unhealthy. Yeah. Um, being a founder with the pressure of both providing for your family, of wanting to deliver for your stakeholders, your employees, your investors, your customers, and really the buck always stopping with you, the weight can get very, very heavy. And you have to find ways to make it through as a human being. Um, I did not consider myself an important part of the equation for about four or five years. I considered my personal health, happiness, um, sort of spiritual uh, strength as not important because I put everyone else first. I had young kids. Uh, my wife gave birth to, to twins a couple years after our, our, our first baby was born. And, and so I felt like I was letting them down all the time. I felt like I was letting the company down all the time, failing all the time. And it really took a toll. And so the highs are super high. You know, those first three years were tripling the business easily, no struggles, no challenges up into the right is amazing. And then boom, you hit roadblocks, whether it's people or process or technology. You know, for us, I think the probably two biggest ones were at the beginning, again, our thesis was not the technology was a major driver. So we underinvested in tech. And it came to bite us later when we started scaling rapidly. All of a sudden, we're doing tens of millions of revenue and the tech can't handle it. It can't process the orders. It can't handle the traffic. It can't get us good data. And so that was a place where in 2016, 2017, we essentially had to rip the whole thing out and build a whole new tech stack. Mm -hmm. And that was expensive, slow, and just painful because it held us back from innovating. But it was absolutely needed to get us to where we wanted to go. Uh, the other one was just on company building. You know, if you'd asked me, hey, you know, what do you think is going to be the hardest part of building a company? I would have put the sort of organizational company building, people building side as like the easiest. But it turns out that hiring a group of people that don't know one another at all, that don't know your business at all, and get them all to work together in a super smooth way is easily, to me, the hardest part of the whole journey. Um, we had great people that really wanted to do a great job, but sometimes we didn't have the right skill sets or sometimes we didn't have the right leadership or maybe I was lacking the right skill set or whatever it might be. And working our way through that as we grew was really tough. And as I talked to more and more founders over time at Techstars and at Amplify where I mentor, this keeps coming up. You get to 20, 25 people, it gets really hard. You get to 50, 55 people, it gets really hard to scale that organization. Um, and, that, and that frankly is another reason why I looked at, hey, who has done this before? Who has taken an organization from 100 to, to 300 or 400? Mm -hmm. And that's a skill set that is very particular and very hard to come by. And so when you think about leadership again, you know, there's different stages and there are unicorns like Mark Zuckerberg who can go from one person to, you know, I don't know how many employees are at Facebook, but a lot. Um, and, and then there are others who, you know, have either passion or skill sets in different areas. And so finding the right place for you, I think is really important. Yeah, no, great point. You know, on that note, uh, one question here about when you first started the company and you were thinking about, you know, employing your first people to help you and you and JP were thinking about skill sets you needed. How did you think about hiring them in the early days? Did you give a lot of equity away at that point in time? Did you incent with equity based on milestones or was this all basically hiring from salary? How did you build the team initially? Yeah, at the, at the very beginning, it was all equity, no cash. Because remember, we only had $13,000. So I had quit my job and was making zero. So we couldn't really afford to pay anyone anything. Um, at a 13 grand, you know, you're paying for server costs, you know, some basics of just keeping the lights on. There's not much left over. And so for the first uh, four or five months pre-launch, we all met once a week at Izzy's Diner up in Santa Monica. We sat around a big table and we had working sessions from 7 to 10 p.m. every Wednesday. And everyone was working for just equity. Um, it, was, it was good chunk of equity that is now worth a good chunk of money for everyone that, that stayed. Yep. Yep. Um, and, uh, and we just found people who really cared about the mission and who wanted to try to build something new and different. We didn't, we cared about skill set too, but we weren't saying like, oh, you know, I need to see X number of years of experience, or whatever it might be. If you were passionate, you had the right skills, you were willing to throw down, we were in. Yep. And so that was our team for the first four or five months. When we launched, um, I, I left my job and went full time and everyone else was still part time. We were doing 10, 20, $30,000 a month with, you know, our, our lead developer in class at UCLA and at, at, at business school. And I would be slacking him or, or at the time WhatsApping him saying like the website's down. He's like, I'm taking a test. Leave me alone. You know, I got, I got to get this done. 
Um, but you do what you need to do to make it work, right? And there were really hard times where we all worked 100 hours a week for $0. Yeah. And the belief was that that equity would be worth the trade-off and the experience would be worth the trade-off and the impact we could have in the world would be worth the trade-off. Yeah, absolutely. Great answers. Uh, let's go with one last question. We'll make it a softball for you. How did you settle on the name Books? And uh, how did you, you're the brand guy. How did you build the brand? Yeah, so um, Books we struggled with at the beginning. It wasn't easy. Um, it, it was the first one that came to mind. It was sort of our, 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 our leader the whole way. So our original name and concept was 30 Books. We were going to be 30 bouquets for 30 bucks. And so we thought this sort of books, bucks, sort of buck stops here kind of play on words was cute. And we liked the word books because it was a shortened version of bouquet. So mm. we're simplifying the, the concept. And then we also loved that it wasn't really a word and we could trademark it. And therefore in SEO, we could own it. No one else could touch it. Um, but people, when we'd talk about it, kept being like, what, like, what are you saying? What word is that? <laughs> and so there, we kept going like, ah, should we change it to something more descriptive? But from a brand positioning perspective, we had two main considerations for sticking with books. Um, one was we ditched the 30 and, and it went to 40 and then we ditched the 40 because we, we learned that our assortment was going to have to grow. So we went to books. Um, and we stuck with it because when you went online and you typed in the word flowers, there was 50 brands that we were never going to catch in SEO. Um, and it was not defensible. Everyone else had bloom this or, or flowers that. And it seemed so very much commoditized. And so we wanted to stand out from everyone. And then we felt like it was very, uh, very unique and in that it, it, it drew people in. So there's two ways you can name a company. One is you can describe it. You know, we could have called it volcanoflowers.com or freshflowers.com or whatever it might be. And that's very descriptive. It tells you what you do. Or you can name it something that is just intriguing and interesting that gets a consumer or a partner or a customer leaning in. Yep. And like Uber. Hey, have you heard about Uber? What's Uber? I never heard about Uber. Mm -hmm. um, and when we said to people, we're the Books company, they would say, Books, like, what's that? And then th that would force a discussion, but have a conversation around, oh, this means shortened supply chain, fresher flowers, sustainable flowers, it's bouquets simplified. And it's stuck in people's mind in a way that farmfreshflowers.com just never would. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we landed on it. Um, you know, Barbara on Shark Tank trashed the name. She said it was the worst name she'd ever heard of. But then a week later, I saw Barbara show up in our customer list and she's been a loyal customer ever since. So she didn't dislike it that much. Yeah. Um, and then building the brand, it goes back to that story and hustle point. You know, we, we started off, I emailed all those friends and family and the way to market an early stage company when you don't have money, I would argue if you do have money, is just by hustling it out, sort of concentric circles out from where you are. Everyone has a network, right? Everyone on this call is connected to Notre Dame. That's a big network. Mm -hmm. um, I used sort of, personal relationships and then close networks like Notre Dame and UCLA and then social media and then started reaching out to PR and I, and I, I reached out directly. I didn't have an agency, but I just networked my way through. LinkedIn is a beautiful thing. A friend of mine knew someone who was an editor at Daily Candy and I reached out via email and said, here's my brand. Here's my story. Volcano flowers, sustainable. Here's some pictures. And she said, I want to be the first to write about you. She put us in Daily Candy. And the great thing about PR is that P PR creates PR. All of a sudden we were on Oprah's wow list and then we were a prize on the price is right, which I grew up loving the price is right. And then Google offers called us and Groupon and living social and Facebook gifts and the gravy train starts to roll partnerships created, which creates more PR, which creates more partnerships. And so, but that all comes back to a great story that people can care about and get invested in. And then you have to hustle the heck out of that story. That's how we built the brand. That's awesome. Awesome story. John, this has been an awesome hour to spend with you. So fun to hear the story. Uh, love the personal nature of the, of the passion behind it and the success. Congratulations on everything that uh, you've accomplished. Um, we at the Idea Center are obviously very hopeful that we can engage you in, in some of the things that we're working on. But I uh, but just want to say congratulations again and thank you uh, for your time. Just Thanks. as we and, close and then together, really, go ahead. Really quickly, to anyone who wants to get in touch, you grab me on LinkedIn. Um, just John Tavis. You can search me very quickly. I'm happy to be connected with anybody on the call. I know there's 400 and some people, but happy to connect with all of you. If I can be helpful anytime, I, I will be. And, um, you know, for, for those of you that are thinking about doing this, and if you want to talk about the journey, I'm, I'm available. Um, and, and most importantly, go Irish, be Duke.
Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. We don't. We definitely don't want to jinx our track record right now. We are the reason we win. So <laughs> go Irish. All right. Awesome. We're excited at the end here that uh, we get to listen to the Notre Dame Glee Club. Uh, one final song for closing, and then uh, I'll give you a little bit of information on our next rally. So, uh, Nick, take it away. The march is on, the rain of Rome, it's not the charge of fighting men. Fantastic. What a great way to end. Uh, just to remind everybody, next week's event uh, will be with Helen Ade Osun, who's the co-founder and CEO of Care Academy. Uh, she was recently named a Fortune 40 under 40. And to register, you can go to ideacenter.nd.edu and click on news and events. And this event will be listed there. Uh, most of you will also receive an email invitation. And if you don't, we'd invite you to uh, get on our email list. So, with that, we'll conclude. Thanks once again, John, for your time. I uh, really appreciate this conversation. It was fantastic. And have a happy Friday to all the rest of you, and go Irish. <laughs>